Okay, so let's sort of start with some very basic intros and a couple of uh, things uh, here are, uh, I've heard myself uh, talk lots of times, so please feel free to uh, interrupt um, anytime you uh, wish and um, uh, if you have a question that you want to ask, uh, feel free to ask, uh, there's no need to wait till the end. Um, I'm happy to th make this session as interactive as possible. Uh, the second thing is, uh, if uh, some of you are comfortable, I would really uh, ask that you can turn on your video so that uh, it's more interactive than uh, just uh, talking to some icons. So that would be nice. And so let's get started. Um, as uh, some of you, as Jilika mentioned, I, I studied electrical engineering and actually uh, uh, did not like biology. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you should not hate something so much because then you'll end up working on it. Uh, but uh, basically, I was very interested in uh, things like this. I'll, I'll show you this one second. So I was very interested in uh, uh, things like this, actually. And this is the reason why sort of engineering was very interesting to me. I used to read a lot of sci-fi. Uh, and uh, books like this by Isaac Asimov uh, you know, were always very interesting to me. And if you compare, and this is still true from the time I joined neuroscience, but uh, this is sort of a major pull for me into neuroscience. And the reason why is that if you compare to where we stand today, uh, you know, in Asimov's books or any sci-fi movie, you'll see that there are robots which are able to interact with us. They talk to us. They, uh, you know, they can have uh, complex uh, sort of considerations about how to uh, take care of humans or not harm humans and so on. So Asimov actually goes through, there's a lot of lovely sort of uh, ethical and, you know, uh, questions of this kind that Asimov's books deal with. But if you contrast to where we stand today, okay, uh, we still type into machines instead of talking to them. And that's partly because uh, speech recognition is still a, uh, generally unsolved problem. So we still have keyboards to actually type in an unambiguous manner into machines. Um, you still can't talk. I mean, there is voice recognition, but uh, there's still enough errors that the machines are still having to use keyboards to interact with us. So that's one sort of interesting difference from all these sci-fi movies where robots should move around and talk to us and all that. They can't understand us today. I mean, machines, basically, we have to type into machines, right? Um, then the second thing is, of course, a kind of more general thing. All of us would love such a functionality. You have a robot that could like clean your dishes, uh, wash your clothes, tidy up your room. And uh, a large part of the reason why uh, robots are not able to do it is because they can't manipulate objects very, uh, very finely. And so it, it's turned out or it's become a big realization for uh, uh, you know, people who do robotics as well as people who study uh, sort of how we control our hands, that there's a lot of intricate feedback that you use when you pick up an object. And if you think of picking up an object like a very flimsy paper cup that you might be having in your college canteens, or uh, you know maybe an egg, which is breakable. And so you have to apply exactly the right amount of force. And uh, you know through very intricate feedback, the kind of forces to apply to not crush the object, but at the same time not drop it. So these are things that are still challenging for robots today. Okay, and so those are reasons why you still only have very rudimentary robots like a vacuum cleaner, but you don't have anything more complex than that that can actually, uh, you know, uh, clean up your room. For you. And of course, a major difference between, uh, you know, between robots and, uh, uh, you know, the robots in sci-fi versus robots today is that, you know, robots still can't do very basic vision tasks. And one example of this is uh, what I put down here, which is that you still unlock your laptop with a password instead of with your face. And that's because face recognition is actually not robust in uh, computers today. And so you still can't just unlock stuff with your face. And uh, on the other hand, like your friends don't have to ID you with some password or, uh, you know, see your ID card uh, to recognize who you are. So it's not like it's an unsolved problem. Uh, in fact, uh, many times uh, computer vision looks like a very challenging problem and it's only because we have the benefit of actually uh, being able to do all these vision tasks with our own brain that you're able to actually say that, oh, you know, this is a solvable problem. Okay, so I see a hand raised. So let's take that question. Was there a raised hand? I thought I saw it temporarily. Okay. I guess uh, someone has a question. Uh, you can uh, ask, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah. 
Okay, so I guess uh, you know, feel free to jump in if you uh, with your thoughts. But uh, if you look at all of these uh, sort of uh, facts, right? Today, the robots that you see around the world, actually, first of all, robots are not very prevalent because there are no practical applications. You don't have robots that actually can really interact with humans in a, in the way that all these sci-fi movies, uh, movies or uh, books imagine uh, this to happen. Okay, maybe they're getting there, but they're still not there yet. Okay, so what's going on? I mean, on the one hand, you have these machines which can actually solve, like, uh, tell you square root of two to the fiftieth decimal place and all that. But on the other hand, you have these uh, same computers which actually can't even do the most basic things. And so this particular uh, sort of paradox has been noted by people before, and uh, this is actually something that was noted in the eighties by this guy called uh, Moravec. And uh, basically, what he says is that what we find hard is going to be easy for computers. So for example. If you want to calculate uh, the product of two ten-digit numbers, those are easy things for computers, right? But on the other hand, what you find easy is going to be the things that uh, are hard for computers. Okay, and that's uh, that's the paradox. So basically, computers can do all these uh, crazy complex calculations. They can beat us in chess. Uh, they can do. Uh, they, recently, they've shown that computers can play the uh, play the game Go. And so all of these things are happening by computers, and they're defeating humans even today. But then, on the other hand, the simple acts of seeing, hearing the word, and recognizing the word, you know, uh, moving around in the world without bumping into stuff or crushing things, and so on, those are the things that are hard for computers. So this is like the most basic stuff. Like you don't need even intelligence to actually do these things. You just go around and do them on your own, and uh, still somehow computers can't do. It. So what's going on? What's this? Uh, what's this all about? What's what's the magic? Uh, uh, so what's what's going on here, right? So that's really what I'll, I'll try to talk to you about. Uh, hopefully, you will get a little bit of a bigger picture. Of course, I'm not going to be able to solve the problem for you because I would be, uh, you know, this is a problem that uh, a lot of smart people have gone at it and really haven't been able to solve. So actually, we can't hope that one person will just solve it instantly. But at least we'll try to understand what is this problem all about. Okay, so that's the basic thing. So. Let's start with vision, and uh, I'll give you an even better example of how vision actually is uh, hard for computers, but very easy for us. And uh, I think all of you have seen these distorted letters on websites. Uh, can you tell me what they're there for? Somebody, uh, somebody can speak up a little. It is captured to recognize whether we are AI or human. Yeah, like they ask yeah. for robot. Yeah. Yeah. So they're there to actually uh, confirm that you're a human being on the internet, right? So you know, to to be a human being on the internet, you don't need to have like uh, you know complex emotions or uh, you know have been in love or you know you don't need to have complex uh, you know principles of justice or democracy. You just need to recognize these letters, right? So what's going on? Like, I mean, why can't computers actually recognize even simple distorted letters? And I I would even say that uh, even somebody who doesn't know how to read, if you give them a cheat sheet. Then they'll be to, they'll be able to recognize and solve these tasks. So it's not even like somebody needs to be able to read. It's just anybody would be able to solve this problem, but computers can't. So like, what's the what the hell is going on, right? So why are computers failing so badly at such a simple thing like this? Okay, that's really the basic question. So we're we're talking about actually very very simple and well defined tasks where um, there's a letter. The shape of the letter is known. There's a finite number of fonts that people can use. And so, like, uh, what's hard about this, right? And this is actually something that I have been puzzling about also for a long time. Why is so? Why is this so hard, right? And so, was there a question? Somebody, uh, I can see somebody uh, trying to say something. Okay. So, all right. So let's uh, go ahead then. So why is it that we can't recognize letters? Okay. So let's consider one. Uh, let me show you a couple of examples of one single letter, and let's think about why is it so hard to recognize the letter. Okay. So here are actually a bunch of ways of writing the letter A, and uh, if you glance across this entire uh, display, right, you will start thinking, well, yeah. I mean, I can see that these are all A's. I mean, maybe the shape is not so obvious in some cases, and a little bit more obvious in other cases. But you can recognize that these are all letter A, right? Now you imagine the the job of a computer trying to do do the same thing, and you'll see that well, the exact pixel patterns that are there in every one of these examples of letter A are not the same, and therefore, if you try to match some pixel pattern 
uh, with the letter, uh, with some stored memory of uh, some letter A, you will actually start finding that all of these letter A's are actually very, very different from each other. And so therein sort of lies the rub, right? You want to recognize the letter A. Uh, and most people actually would just look at all of these. And even if you've never seen that particular font A, you will still recognize the letter A. And so somehow all of us understand this idea of A-ness, right? As you might uh, say. And uh, we all know what is A, <laughs> right? So it's sort of a weird and funny thing to say because like, what is the letter A? And you feel like you intuitively know exactly what it is. But then computers actually don't understand the concept of A, right? And this holds true for any object. Like you can see a chair with a design that you've never seen before. And you will instantly recognize this as a chair. And uh, uh, computers can't. And uh, there's some kind of uh, ability that we have to actually tolerate, um, you know, tolerate the uh, uh, tolerate variations and yet recognize the object or the recognize the essence in some sense. Okay, so that's the question here. Well, I think uh, I've been saying these things, and you might be thinking, well, like, uh, what uh, you know, what about AI? Like, what is this guy talking about? Has he been living kind of under the rock? And uh, you know, the the what about uh, artificial intelligence? You must have read lots of media articles saying that machine learning is the next revolution. Uh, machines have solved vision, they've solved speech, they've solved chess, they've defeated humans in Go. And if you believe the media hype, then uh, AIs are going to solve like uh, you know all the world's problems: global warming, world peace. Uh, the only problem is that you gotta actually sort of hold back and check against do some kind of reality check, right? And if you look at the reality check. Here's another example of it. If you try to make people uh, do a simple task or you make computers do a simple task, the task is to find a person in the scene. And so in the scene, if there's a person, you have to say yes. If there's no person, you have to say no. And if you look at the, uh, this simple task of taking the, detecting people in natural scenes, you will find that state of the art uh, AI algorithms or the best machine learning algorithms are doing 80% correct. Okay, humans on the other hand are actually at 96% correct and the few errors that the humans make is simply because like, you know, there'll be a person in the image in the previous trial, current trial, next trial and the, the next to next trial people will be trying to say that there's a person just because of repetition or some pattern coming across them. So, but if you take a human doing this kind of task, they'll almost be at 100%. So, there's, a, there's still a big, uh, there's still a big sort of performance gap between how uh, computers are able to see and solve real world vision problems versus how we are able to solve uh, the same vision problems. Okay, so before you start jumping to conclusions that, oh, you know, AIs are going to rule the world. Well, they can't rule the world very well at the moment because even the most basic tasks are still unsolved. Okay, so there was a question uh, somewhere. I'm uh, sorry, I'm keep, I keep saying that there's a question because I see some kind of hand or some uh, audio and then I'm not. So speaking. it's just uh, people are doing <laughs> wahoo. Oh, and all okay, this. Okay, fine. okay, so it's there, probably you know, by accident. Yeah, yeah. So you're all doing some uh, very rapid visual tasks on, and then finding, you know, finding that I, I see it, but then it's not. <laughs> Okay, so that's fine. So basically, this is the problem, right? So like we uh, we want computers to be able to just look at an image and recognize because we want a robot to look look around and actually recognize the objects in the scene, right? But then the robot can't do it at a very good accuracy, and so the problem is that eighty percent is okay for exam mark, but eighty percent is not okay because the AI or the robot has to look at thousands of images in a given uh, you know within a you know every second we make five eye movements, and so you're looking at thousands of images being and if you have 20% error rate, you actually end up making lots and lots of errors. And so you can't really use it in a commercially sort of viable uh, manner. Okay, so that's one problem. The other problem with AI uh, systems today is that they're actually uh, crippled by a very weird kind of error. And uh, the error is actually shown over here. Uh, these are known as adversarial images. So here's an image of a panda. And the AI actually categorizes the uh, image as a panda with 57% confidence, not bad. Now you add an imperceptible amount of noise to it. And now the algorithm is categorizing the same image, which looks the same to us, but it, there's a very small amount of noise being added. And now it says it's a given with 99% confidence, 
Okay, so these kinds of examples are actually there where AI systems are actually making really weird errors. And here's another example of a weird error. You have a image which has been called a, called as a king penguin, another image that has been called a starfish, and basically no human would make this kind of mistake. And so the kinds of mistakes that AI systems are making, even though they're getting like decent performance, if you will, but the errors are actually very, very strange. And so they're actually not usable also for this kind of reason. Okay, so these are the two sort of issues that are going on. So then you might be wondering, well, how does the brain actually solve vision, right? So uh, if uh, if the computers, if the best of computers and actually the best of minds, you know, people working at uh, Facebook, Google, uh, all of these uh, cases, they're not able to solve vision in a very, very deep way. Well, then how does the brain solve vision? And uh, the brain's ability to solve vision stands as a kind of existence proof for us that yes, this problem can be solved, right? So how does the brain solve vision? Well, it turns out, and this is an example of uh, the monkey brain. I'm sorry, uh, this is a, a, a thing about neuroscientists that we tend to show only the brain and there's no body shown anywhere, anywhere here. So like the eyes are out here and the information from the eyes go to, goes to the back of the head. And uh, there's a series of areas which are shown here. And you can see that a large part of the brain is actually concerned with this very tiny piece of tissue in your body, right? And uh, visual processing actually occupies a huge amount of brain regions. And uh, the number of regions that are actually uh, driven by visual information uh, is actually almost 40% of the brain. And so you can imagine that uh, the 40% of your brain regions are actually uh, involved in processing this information on a very tiny tissue. And that's because vision is uh, awesome but also because vision is a hard problem. And so uh, the brain also needs to spend a lot of real estate solving this problem. So we know, for example, that, you know, the vision is not easy for the brain either because the brain is actually allocating a lot of resources to solve the problem of vision. Well, then how is the brain solving vision? I want to give you a couple of examples of how, you know, we always tend to have this picture like the eye is like a camera. And so whatever you see, your eye is just taking in. And then, you know, you're, uh, that's all. And there's somebody watching the TV inside. Of course, that's sort of, uh, you know, who that somebody is, is another deep <laughs> you know, philosophical problem. And uh, we don't even know what the TV that is uh, inside. So, uh, but let's take a couple of examples of how our perception is not like actually interpreting the output of a camera. Okay. And so let me show you a couple of examples of this. Uh, the first example I want to show you is this uh, very nice illusion. Uh, where I hope all of you can see that the bottom surface, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but the bottom surface is actually looking bright and the top surface looks dark, right? Is that true for everyone? Yes. I guess, yes. Uh, yes. yeah. So if that's the case, well, then uh, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to show you the, I'm going to show you, I'm going to change the image in one way and you're going to see that actually, if you look here, now I've blocked the center part of the image. And now the two parts of the, the two surfaces on the above and below actually look like the same shade of green, right? So if that's really happening for all of you, then the question is, what the hell is going on? It's apparently as if the brightness of the top surface is dependent upon the brightness or some information which is being shown in the central part of the image, right? So it's sort of a weird thing. Your vision or your interpretation of the surface brightness depends on some other, loca some other location in the image, right? So I'm turning, now interesting thing is, I showed you this, so I'm sort of proving to you that the top and bottom surfaces are the same shade of gray. But then now if I remove this white bar, notice what happens. Again, you're back to the same sort of knowledge that, or you're back to the same interpretation that the top surface is bright and the, and the bottom surface is dark. Uh, sorry, top surface is dark and the bottom surface is bright. So what has also happened now is that despite me giving you some extra knowledge about this particular image, your visual system basically says, you know what, I don't care what Arun has told you, I'm just going to tell you whatever I see. And uh, your visual system remains stuck to this particular belief that the top surface is dark and the bottom surface is bright. So now I want you all to tell me actually what's going on. Okay, so do you think this is, uh, so why do you think your brain is fooling you? First of all, is the brain actually fooling you? And if it's fooling you, then why is it fooling you in this particular way? Sorry, 
sir i think that it is taking into consideration the context so when we are taking in relative terms uh, means like the the upper side is kind of dark as compared to the lower is because of the comparatively it is seeming to the brain that yeah there is some shade difference maybe i'm not sure sorry correct correct but you're just saying that it looks that way because it looks that way I and mean, what's the sort of explanation so the bottom part if you look at the image right the bottom part is actually uh, uh, looking like a bright surface why would why so like what's going on there uh, punam you had a yeah i wanted to take a guess <laughs> yeah 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 please go ahead so is it a presence of shadows that is right. causing us to interpret it like right. this correct correct so this is uh, you're you're on the right track so basically what's happening is that the bottom surface is actually looking to you like it's in the shadow okay that's a very important clue and the middle part of the image which i'm showing over here which was blocking over there is the crucial sort of information that tells you that this bottom side bottom part is in the shadow of course there's another clue down here but somehow your brain is not really using that too much the real cue that you're seeing here is that this part tells you that the light is coming from above it's shining on this part and this part but the bottom surface is actually in the shadow so now consider what's happening the bottom surface gives the same amount of light to your retina as the top surface but the bottom surface it must be actually brighter right and so your visual system is actually doing a very complex kind of reasoning here because your visual system wants to know what is the true brightness of the surface it doesn't care about the image that is coming in because the image could be looking darker or brighter or some object could be looking darker or brighter because of the shadows in the scene right what i want to know is the true nature of the objects that are around me and this is amazing your visual system basically says hey if something is in the shadow it must be lit by less light and therefore if it is equally bright as something that is in the light then i will conclude that the the one that is in the shadow is actually a bright surface right i find it actually really amazing that you know visual systems in something so complex uh, in the span and it's an instant judgment right you're not even actually spending some time thinking about it it's what your visual system does all the time right any questions about this yeah j if you have a question yeah hi sir uh, so not exactly a question but i was like wondering about something yeah um so on the one hand you just explained to us that since the bottom part is in the shadow we are interpreting it that it should be right. less bright mm -hmm. so that kind of points towards like how we are using our how the visual system is interacting with our cognitive abilities to make that interpretation well, actually why do you think it's even interacting with your cognitive abilities i would say that this is something that seems to be an automatic process in the visual system to do this kind of reasoning okay yeah so i think i mean i so for example right if it was dependent upon your thinking then uh, you might i mean the moment i showed you that it's actually you know they're equally uh, you know if i showed you this part where i show that the two surfaces are equally bright actually in the image then you should have completely believed it and the next time i showed you the illusion you should be like no i see the two surfaces are equally equally gray but yeah that's exactly automatically sort of just doing this and it has you have no control over your visual system here right okay yeah I, that's exactly what i was thinking about yeah. since yeah. we are using we are using our reasoning abilities in both the cases yeah it's kind of a conflicting situation ah uh, but i would say that the solution to this conflict is that your visual system basically doesn't care what you think whether i mean this is what i find so cool that i mean you might be a happy person sad person north india south india east india west india. who cares your visual system basically everybody sees the illusion the same way right so your visual all our visual systems despite all the incredibly you know very different experiences that we all have uh, you know all have concluded the same thing which is that the bottom surface is bright right Yeah right right. Yeah, Ananya had a question. Uh, is this uh, inherent or this is learned uh, because of experiences? 
we don't know so uh, it's definitely the case that uh, some images uh, you know actually uh, there's a classic sort of footprint uh, in the sand kind of illusion that uh, if you turn the image upside down it actually looks like the footprints are raised above the sand and so these are all, i mean there have been some suggestions that uh, we tend to have a prior or a prior belief that light should fall from above but i think in this particular case uh, there's a there's a number of cues that are telling you that the bottom surface is actually in the shadow and uh, there's at least uh, three right i mean let's say for example one is these shadows that are formed at the in the middle the second is this actual cast shadow of the object and the third is in general we think uh, in general light is always from above and this is one of the reasons why if you shine light from below on your face and look at it in the mirror it looks really weird and scary and that's just because very rarely objects are lit by light from below uh, most of the time objects are lit by light from above and there's been some suggestion that this kind of knowledge is sort of just encoded you know innately in your visual system but i'm not sure i've seen like conclusive proof for that okay thank you yeah okay so um, <clears throat> let's uh, let's go ahead with a couple of more examples so why i'm showing you these examples is because your visual system is not behaving like a camera in this case right i hope that that is clear and your visual system is also not behaving very flakily in fact it has very systematic uh, sort of uh, inferences about what's going on in the scene and uh, in a way i would say that many of these illusions that you come across like optical illusions actually often expose the kind of reasoning that is uh, Uh, being used by your visual system rather than actually showing some kind of uh, fatal flaw in your uh, in your brain and you know uh, often they're made out to be uh, they're made out to say that oh you know don't believe your eyes and all that but uh, in fact nothing could be further from the truth you should believe your eyes because no matter how you know no matter where you're from and you know what you do and how happy or sad you are your visual system is always telling you the same thing Right? and you want this to be the case you don't want your uh, perceptions to be completely dramatically altered just because of your uh, the state of the rest of your mind okay so let me let me go through a couple of examples just to drive home the point and because they're also cool examples so here's another example here this is known as the color strawberry illusion and uh, first i want to establish that all of you see these strawberries as red yes yeah Okay, great. So now I'm going to show you that they're not actually red. <laughs> so here's the proof, right? I'm just taking the same color uh, sort of background and joining it up to the strawberries, and you can see that the background here, down here, looks gray. There's no edges out here, and then suddenly this part looks reddish. Okay, so again, what what the hell is happening, right? So again, this is a sort of uh, again complex kind of inference that your brain is doing, right? So what your brain is basically saying is, hey. this particular scene is, seems to be illuminated by bluish or bluish green light and so if a, if i see a particular portion of the image as gray but i know that the scene was illuminated by green and blue light then that particular object must be gray must be red okay so in other words a red object illuminated by bluish green light would look gray okay so your brain is again concerned not with the actual measurement of the rgb values of or the red green and blue levels of the uh, things in the image but actually it's concerned about what is it that the true color of the object is and the brain is successfully inferring that in this particular case that the brain that uh, these objects are actually red in color okay any questions about this so that rbg value you said how uh, could you elaborate on that the brain is evaluating the rbg well, value well i'm just saying that you know if you if you just if your brain was just measuring the pixel levels here like the the red green and blue levels here then you would find that the red green and blue levels are actually gray so you should be seeing all of these strawberries as gray right but on the other hand actually you're seeing these strawberries as red and the reason why is because if you take red strawberries and illuminate them by this greenish blue light that is you know that is falling on this entire image then you would get gray color okay okay sir got it yeah uh, divya has a hand up yeah yes hi um, my question is so if you seeing a fruit or something uh, of which you do not know the color yeah. how would that be registered um, under a different kind of lighting yeah. 
it's it's a good question so i think uh, let's see so i think it would work anyway because your brains basically understanding that uh, the the color of the light falling on the scene is some particular color and uh, usually you need a sufficiently complex or uh, you know sufficiently colored scene to actually infer the color of the light remember that if you just took a patch of you know if you take a if you take a patch of a particular color and you only look at the patch and you shine some other light on it you can make it look any color you want and in fact if you have like those christmas lights at home because of uh, in recently going through christmas uh, you might have noticed that you know if the light is red then objects look in a particular way you you change the the light color changes and the object color does change but you know very often that's because that's the only color of light that is falling and your brain can't really invert you know separate the color of the light from the color of the object but there are many cases where your brain is able to do it in fact and uh, this is one of those cases and uh, i think again i don't think we know completely the conditions under which your brain can infer the color of the light and separate it from the object color that is being uh, that is looking at so it's an interesting question right what you are seeing is the product of the light incident light color times the color of the object this is actually mathematically true and so you need to actually de uh, you know you need to separate these two things and uh, it looks like in certain situations it's separable but uh, certain other situations maybe it's not separable and so then the brain doesn't actually try to separate it uh, akanksha had a question akanksha go ahead go ahead yeah actually i wanted to ask uh, do color blind people also perceive uh, the colors in the same way i have i have uh, well, so color blind people don't see colors the same way uh but um, i'm not sure if they actually experience these illusions i have to check i mean i, I think uh, 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 interesting question i don't know i don't know yeah yeah and if you i mean if you have friends who are color blind or you know someone is color blind you should check out these illusions on them um, uh, yeah. i think maybe they sir, sir. Yeah. i do have, I do have uh, one friend who is color blind So, so I talked with him about this. He said he that he is not totally color blind. It's just, just that the shades can't be discriminated. So, if green has some particular color, the shades of green, like for example, in blue we have turquoise hue, and then that cerulean something like that, different shades of blue. So, those shades can't be distinguished. So that's yeah. why illusion still works for them. At least they, uh, he has said. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's a. it's an interesting point that actually there are different types of color blindness too so you have to kind of correlate uh, exactly the i mean the kind of color deficit they may have plus uh, then check out all these color illusions turns out that actually color is not very important for your uh, perception and recognition many animals have actually very impoverished color blindness uh, uh, they, they have impoverished color vision and uh, they're still able to go about the world just fine and all those things so there's in, there's some interesting things to say about color vision not a, i mean i don't want to hijack my own talk but there's a lot of interesting things about color vision yeah okay so uh, let's go ahead to another kind of display and this is actually a, a interesting uh, illusion called the thatcher effect and this is uh, named so because of the british prime minister uh, margaret thatcher Uh, whose face is manipulated here if you look at these two faces they they probably look very similar and uh, you might think that okay this is a inverted uh, version of somebody's face but notice what happens when you actually turn them up right yeah so this uh, the the right uh, the right uh, face is obviously super distorted but you don't see this right hand side face to be actually very distorted unless it is upright in orientation right so what's going on here well uh seems like when you look at an inverted face you don't really process it too well and so uh, in a lot of inverted faces will look similar all of you you know when you were kids i hope you uh, looked at lots of things upside down and uh, had fun looking at how smiles become uh, sad faces and so on and uh, that's basically what's happening so basically like when you are i mean we don't really frequently see inverted faces and so we are very good at distinguishing upright faces or detecting any changes in upright faces and we're not very good at doing the same thing on inverted faces and why is this interesting because again if your brain was just working at like a camera then whether it's a, whether an image is upright or inverted shouldn't have mattered right 
the the same difference is there between the two images, whether it is upright or inverted. But yet, you see the upright difference to be very very strong, whereas the inverted difference, which is shown over here, is actually not very very strong. Right? Any questions about this? All right. So let's uh, let's go ahead now. Uh, uh, I've just tried to give you like a bunch of uh, uh, sort of uh, you know uh, examples showing to you how the brain is actually not behaving like a simple camera. Uh, let me also give you a demo of uh, kind of uh, uh, what is happening inside the brain. And uh, this is actually a, I'm showing you the brain uh, picture again. This is the monkey brain. The eyes are out in the front. Uh, the uh, the initial output of the eyes goes to the back of the head. Incidentally, this is why you get, uh, this is why you see stars when somebody hits you on the back of the head because directly your visual cortex is being uh, stimulated. Okay, so I'm going to show you an experiment now uh, where we are recording from uh, neurons in this particular region in the brain called IT. Okay, this IT stands for inferior temporal cortex. And uh, the way this experiment goes is that you actually insert a very thin microelectrode uh, which is uh, insulated all the way except for the tip. So at the tip, it will pick up some electrical signals. And if you move the electrode, then you'll go closer to some neurons and further away from others. And on a good day of recording, you'll get a signal like this. And of course, on a bad day of recording, I'm not, not going to show you what it looks like. It looks like that. Okay. So now if you look at a signal like this, what I'm going to show you is actually the uh, recorded activity of a single neuron from IT. Uh, which is uh, converted into an audio signal. So you're going to hear sounds like trr, 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 and, so on, and so on, which are actually the uh, which are actually individual action potentials, as these are called, uh, of a single neuron converted from the electrical signal that is picked up into an audio signal. The audio signal is only for our sort of matching purposes. What you're going to see in the next screen is actually what the animal saw. This is a live animal which is actually performing a task. And while the animal is doing a task, you're actually eavesdropping on the activity in this part of the brain. And so what you're going to see is what the animal saw. And what you're going to hear over the speakers is actually the electrical activity of a single neuron. Right? This is the setup. So let me just go ahead and play this. So, and what I want you to do is to actually match the, uh, notice the correlation between what you see and what you hear. Okay. I hope the audio is coming through. Uh, were you able to get the audio? Yes. Okay, great. So tell me what you, uh, what, what do you think uh, was going on? So sorry, sir. Sir, could you please repeat that 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 tuk tuk sound was when and means like what do you wanted to observe? Sir? Oh, the, uh, I was just saying the uh, the tuk aha uh -huh. PowerPoint didn't like this um, uh, neuron. Let me just. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so what I wanted to wanted you to see is the correlation between uh, uh, between the sound of the uh, the the response of the neuron, which is a, a converted into audio, uh, and the uh, the images that the animal saw. Okay, so this is a reconstruction of an actual experiment that we've done. And so you're going to see what the animal saw, and then you're going to hear the electrical activity of a single neuron. Uh, let me try playing it again. I think PowerPoint might crash again, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, is that fine? Okay, got it, sir. Here it is only firing when the animals are seen, not the other inanimate objects. Right. Maybe. But the other, but the other thing that you would have noticed is that uh, the response of the neuron is the same for the for two views of the same object, right? And uh, turns out that uh, actually, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, we see, uh, you know, it turns out that in this kinds of recordings, you'll see neurons that respond to specific objects. And uh, these neurons will respond to the same objects even if you show them at a different size, different position, different uh, viewpoint, and so on. So suggesting that uh, neurons in this region 
are actually responsible for how you recognize objects at different distances or different viewpoints and so on, at different distortions and so on. Okay, so this is a region that we know because of this and many other reasons. We know that this region is important for object recognition. If you delete this region in uh, in animals, or if you uh, or if humans have damage to that part of the brain uh, because of stroke or some other uh, accident and so on. cannot recognize objects and so we know that this region is actually very crucial for uh, recognizing objects and also uh, the reason I'm also showing this is that the problem of vision is solved by this state. In other words, if you want to do any kind of visual task, all you have to do is to listen to the activity of neurons in this region and you will be able to solve these complex tasks. Okay, that also suggests that by a particular stage of visual processing in the brain, the problem is solved. Right? Because it could be that there could be lots of lot, lots and lots of regions that uh, the problem is actually never solved by any particular one region and so on. So, but in this case, we know that if you record from uh, the activity of uh, even a few hundred neurons in this region, then we know that we can solve the problem of, we can solve any visual task basically. Okay, so this is sort of how the brain is solving vision. If you understand how neurons in this part of the brain work, uh, in the we, if you understand the kinds of features these neurons respond to, then we'll be able to understand how vision actually works. Okay, so that's the. Okay, so this is sort of an introduction to sort of our uh, what we do in our lab. Uh, this is an overview. So we're really interested in how the brain solves vision. Uh, we do this through a number of different experiments. One is visual perception in humans. Uh, we also do some human brain imaging and we're hoping to do some uh, perturbation kind of studies as well. Uh, we do single neuron recordings like what I've just shown you uh, in monkey uh, visual cortex. And we also use a lot of computational modeling to compare the kinds of representations we get from uh, different levels in the brain to what we see in computers. And that's a very useful and interesting direction. Okay. So let me show you a couple of studies that we've done in our lab. Uh, we may not have time to do the whole uh, to do everything, but uh, you know it's it's uh, more important that uh, all of you understand whatever whatever the study I will show you. So let's uh, let's talk about one study and let's come back to this question of actually recognizing these distorted letters that I was talking about. And this is work done by Harish, uh, who was a postdoc in our lab and he's off at uh, NIH uh, now. So if you think about this question, how does the brain actually solve or recognize distorted letters? Then you might be thinking, well, you know, how is it that the brain is actually so good at recognizing this distorted versions of these letters when letters itself have been invented only very recently in terms of his historical uh, you know, development, right? So, well, part of the reason why we're actually so good at recognizing letters is that even real objects get distorted in some ways. So, for example, this particular object, which is a picture of a dog, is distorted in a, in a particular way when you rotate the viewpoint. Similarly, this particular cup is being distorted in some way. So your brain is always dealing with some distortion or the other anyway. And so I would actually say that this distortion is just one of the example distortions that you know, things can go through. And your brain is pretty good at actually solving or understanding the distortion. But that doesn't still tell us how is it that the brain is actually able to recognize the distortion from the identity or the, you know, the, the letter itself. So this was a question that Harish and I wanted to understand. And so how do neurons respond to this sort of letter strings? And here's one kind of possibility, right? So imagine that you have a particular string and you're presenting that particular string in two distortions. One of course is sort of the undistorted version of the string and the other is some distortion. Okay. Then you have some other string. And again, this that other string is having some distortion one or distortion two. And now here's the concept that we wanted to test, which is that we said, maybe if the brain has to recognize the string separately from the distortion, it must be able to separate the string from the distortion in some way. And so we defined what we called as separable responses, where the response to a particular combination, that is a particular string at a particular distortion, would be a product or the sum of some string response and some distortion response. Okay, this is a very basic kind of thing. So please uh, stop me if you don't understand this. I'm happy to explain a bit further. The other kind of response that we thought the brain could have is that there could be an inseparable response whereby the response to a particular string at a particular distortion is not equal to the product of anything to do with the uh, string and anything to do with distortion. So the idea is, is the brain separating the string from the distortion or not? 
right? So this is one kind of question. The other kind of question we thought is, if you wanted to recognize a string of letters, then you've got to be able to separate the string of letters into separate, uh, separate letters. And so this is again what we wanted to ask in this level. We said, is the response of the brain or in this particular part of the brain, because we know that this particular part of the brain is involved in recognition. Then the question is, is the response to this come uh, to a combination of letters? Can this be understood in terms of the individual letters? Okay, and so again, we can define what could be a separable response and notice that whether it's the sum or the product, if I can understand the response to a string using some components, then it's a separable response. Whereas if you can't understand the response of a string using the individual parts of the string, then it's an inseparable response. I hope this separable and inseparable idea is clear because I'm going to say, keep saying this and if you don't understand it now, then you'll sort of not understand the rest of it. Yeah? Okay, so then we can go ahead and say, well, how do... Sir, I just wanted to ask one thing that this seven is not a letter, right? So I'm kind of getting confused there. What is not a letter? Seven. Yeah, yeah. So we are just talking about letters in the sense letters and numbers. It doesn't really matter. Like, I mean, as far as... Okay, it, yeah. In mm -hmm. fact, in this particular experiment, we're doing this on monkeys, which uh, we've certainly not trained our monkeys to read. So like... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So like, I mean, they, they don't care whether it's a letter or a string. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at what the what an actual neuron's response might look like. We did a, we did the kind of recordings that I showed you, and in those ta in those recordings, the animals are actually not taught to do any kind of recognition of those letters. They're just taught to look at the screen, and for looking at the screen for some time, they get a juice reward. If they don't look at the screen, they don't get juice. Conversely, if they don't want to work, they won't look at the screen, and then they don't get data back. In. So this is completely, we are at the mercy of the animal in the experiment in this particular case. Okay. So then we collected the response of a few hundred neurons. I'm going to show you one example neuron here. So here's the response of the neuron where I'm looking at the response of multiple different letters presented at various different distortions on the, on the left side. And if you see the observed response, you can see that there's a kind of columnar organization. The left to right over here is the position relative to the center of case. So if it is plus one, it is contralateral and yeah, minus one, it's left and plus one is right for simplicity. Okay. So now what we said is, can we explain the response of this neuron using some model where I'm only, where the, where the only information that the model has is some preference for the letters and some preference for the position of the letter and some preference for the distortion. So again, we are testing a separable model. And what we are showing here in this particular plot, and the details are not too crucial here, but the idea here is that we are taking two possible types of separability. In one case, the response to distorted letters is a product of shape tuning and distortion tuning and position tuning. The other case, the response to distorted letters is a sum of the shape tuning and distorted tuning. Basically, what we find is that the multiplicative model is actually better. So in other words, for neurons, they actually encode distortions in terms of the product of the shape and the distortion that it undergoes. Okay, so that's one result. The second kind of result is how do neurons respond to multiple letters? And again, the same kind of principle is shown here. We have lots and uh, lots and lots of letter strings. These are combination of two letters at a time, three letters at a time. These are all shown to the animal. We record from the response of the same neuron. And the question is, can I understand the response of the neuron using a separable combination where the response to a combination is a sum or product of the individual letter responses. So we have individual letter responses and the responses to string. And basically, again, what you can see here, there's a very small effect across the population. It's not like something that you will get very, very differently. And if you think about it, the sum and the product of two numbers are always correlated. So you'll not be able to separate it too well in any way. But then if you look at the response of these uh, neurons, you can see that these neurons are actually better explained by an additive model than a multiplicative model, suggesting that the response to multiple letters is a sum but not product of single letter responses. So basically what have we learned here, right? To just get back to the overall summary. Well, seems like the brain is using two rules to crack or understand distorted letters. So what are the two rules? The first rule is, the response to distorted letters is a product, but not the sum of shape tuning and distorted tuning. Okay. The second uh, rule is that the response to multiple letters is a sum, but not a product of single letter responses. Okay. Well, then you might be wondering, well, 
Are these two really rules sufficient to crack captures? Can we really recognize distorted letters that way? And the way to test these things is because, you know, if you look at the observed data, then of course, yes, there is a subtle effect where the neurons are responding in the, according to these rules that we are saying, but maybe there are anyway unexplainable things that the neurons are anyway using and therefore able to actually uh, recognize these distorted letters. So basically then, can, how can I prove it? Well, the way we thought we could prove it is to actually take a set of artificial neurons and then embody these rules in these artificial neurons so that there is nothing in terms of their response other than these encoded rules. Okay, so in other words, there's no other magic sauce. Whereas if you look at the observed data that we collected from the thing, maybe there is some magical sort of uh, hidden element in the responses that allow these neurons to dis decode distorted levels. But if you take an artificial population of neurons, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing extra that is there. It's only these two rules. And it turns out that these two rules are actually exactly what you need to de uh, decode individual letters in a string of distorted, in a, in a distorted letter string. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, bars that are shown here. Don't worry about the exact nature unless you really want to uh, know more. But what you can see here is if you take, uh, if you take a population of artificial neurons where the response to a string is the sum of the individual letters, and you take multiplicative encoding of distortions, then basically you get perfect decoding. And so what that means is that if you have neurons of this kind, you can certainly crack and read distorted letters. Okay, and it turns out that if you take neural networks, which are trained for uh, text recognition, then you see many of these rules actually emerging naturally anyway. But the idea is that they're not perfect and therefore they don't reach perfect decoding of uh, strings. Okay, so to summarize what I've just shown you till now, how does our brain correct captures? Apparently, using the some kind of separable code where you're encoding the uh, complex distorted string in terms of the individual letters and in terms of in, and by separating the distortions from each other. Okay, so I'm not sure how much time we have. Uh, can you? So, so I was just ask. I was just curious that in this uh, programmable this uh, uh, artificial neural network that you use. So yeah. means like how much means so the hidden layers was how much deep means like was oh, it so simple one are, or uh, so kind uh, of architecture of I the think, neural network? Yeah, so I believe these were actually uh, feed forward uh, networks trained for uh, text recognition in scenes, and uh, this was I think. Uh, uh, must I think it was BGG architectures, but we've also tested other ones as well, ResNet and so on. So um, I, I'm not. I have to go back and look up the details. But uh, we've tested a bunch of networks uh, which seem to have the same sort of, uh, which were all trained on text recognition of various kinds, and it turns out that all of them actually show this kind of separability. Uh, but uh, we've not actually again try to compare the separability in neurons versus the separability in neural networks because the noise and everything. Uh, is not really comparable and it's, there's no direct, there's no clean way of making a comparison. But it looks like separability is certainly something that emerges in your networks and it's certainly there in the brain, at, the, at least at this level, yeah. Okay, so uh, how much time do I have? I know it's uh, six o'clock. Uh, should I? Um, sir, you can take five more minutes, five to 10 more minutes. Okay, fine. Okay, so let me show you, let me show you one other study, and uh, this is uh, yeah. So maybe yeah, let me just show you one other study. So this is actually uh, another study that I want uh, to share, which is uh, work that we've done in uh, collaboration with uh, Professor Kavias Hari from uh, Electrical Engineering Department and uh, Akash Agarwal, who's a Biomedical Engineering uh, uh, PhD student in the lab. Okay, so. Here's the question, how do we read words? So we already just talked about reading individual letters or distorted letters, but then of course in language we are reading much more complex and much longer strings and all that. So let's step back a bit and consider how amazing sort of reading itself is, right? So, uh, you know, we are, we are able to look at a string of just letters and shapes and we're able to, uh, you know, uh, create so many vivid imagined worlds and go into the minds of real people, understand other minds and so on. So it's a really amazing kind of cultural invention. Yet at the same time, reading is a very recent invention. So which means that evolution has not had the time to actually optimize the reading in any way. So our visual system has been just sort of hijacked for the purpose of reading. I'll, I'll show you in a second how. But uh, those of you who are interested, I would really suggest that you go to this book. Uh, it's called Reading in the Brain. 
and is by one of the pioneers in this field of reading. And uh, you can you can you can uh, read more about reading. And uh, there's a lot of fascinating stuff that is out there. But let me actually just uh, summarize all that fascinating stuff in one slide, and uh, to say that when you look at a string of letters in this particular case, a capture. And uh, the eyes are out here. This is the human brain, by the way, which is slightly differing in structure. Uh, we have a much bigger uh, prefrontal cortex and all that, but basically, much of the brain regions can be mapped one to one. But it turns out, when you learn to read, an entirely new visual area is formed in your brain. And this is actually a region called the visual bird form area, BWFA. It's there if you learn to read a particular language. Uh, and uh, it responds more to printed words of uh, you know the of the script that you know, and it doesn't respond to ob other objects or scrambled words. So that's how we actually find this particular area. In the brain. And it turns out that if you activate your visual world from area very strongly when you learn to, when you're reading, then you're a very fluent reader. So it's actually the visual world from area is definitely sort of correlated and involved when you're when you're reading something. Okay, uh, so. Uh, the question or the study that we wanted to do was to understand what happens when you actually read jumbled words. And so here's an example. Um, all of you probably read, uh, all of you have probably come across this kind of uh, uh, text somewhere or the other. Uh, Tanya, yes, yes. yes uh, I had a question regarding uh, how these areas would be formed for d reading different languages because you can be fluent yeah. in reading one language and not being fluent in another. Uh, so we've uh, we've done some studies where we looked at uh, the visual word, word form area in uh, people who could read Telugu and English, and so we looked at the Telugu word form area and uh, you know English word form area, and we also looked at people who could read Malayalam, and uh, we looked at the Malayalam word form area and the and the English word form area. We actually never saw any systematic differences in the location of the uh, of the regions. But uh, in general, because all of us are bi bilingual and you know, typically they can read more than one script, uh, it turns out I think that the word form area is in the same location. Presumably, the two representations are multiplexed into each other. Uh, we don't really know too much about exactly if there are links between these two representations and so on. But uh, it is. Uh, but they're certainly in the same place. That's as far as we we've, we've got. Okay. So, is there any possibility of like uh, the two? areas being interlinked uh, yes but uh, we have to form specific uh, sort of hypothesis and actually this is a very tiny region in the brain and so it's a little hard to get uh, data out of it and all that but yeah I, mean, I think uh, people do look at multilingual uh, or bilingual uh, you know uh, uh, brain representations and most of it in terms of language itself because actually the you know, you could be bilingual because not because not just because you can read two languages, but you can understand two languages. And you know, there's 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 a lot of work on bilingual uh, uh, responses to uh, responses to two languages in bilingual sense. Okay. okay. Uh, some other questions. Sir, could dyslexic uh, patients give any idea? It's like that dyslexic patients are quite quite slow in reading and yeah, definitely. Dyslexic. So, and we are looking at actually uh, the kinds of uh, visual processing differences that may be there in uh, people who can read well versus not well and so on. So we've done some of those studies, yeah. Uh, Poonam, you had a question? Yes, uh, I wanted to ask uh, what happens to the languages that are learned in adulthood versus childhood? If you are um, learning a new script in adulthood, uh, will that go to a separate area or still only one area will be responsible? Yeah, it's a good question. I actually don't uh, don't know the literature like that. I mean, a lot of times it's difficult to find those kinds of people who might have acquired a language early and then became bilingual uh, much later. Usually what happens is many exactly. bilinguals are actually bilinguals uh, right from the beginning. So they're exposed to both languages or there's a slight delay in when they uh, learn the next, the second language. But a uh, lot of bilinguals are actually bilinguals from very early age. So I don't know the literature on whether people actually form a, you know, what kinds of language representation there are in people who acquire the second language later. Uh, I'm not completely sure. Yeah. It's an interesting question though. I mean, like it's obviously, I mean, especially in India, there's a lot of this variability. 
yeah, I mean, when you live, most of the scientists have lived as, lived as expats somewhere and right. mostly had to acquire a second language in right. a much later age. So yeah, yeah. That, that's why my question. Yeah, yeah, it'll be there and I, I don't know. So like, I think, uh, I mean, there's definitely a difference between how quickly you can activate your brain for your first language versus the second language. So like the second language is typically what you're less fluent in. And uh, there's definitely a difference like that. I'm not sure, uh, yeah, we haven't actually also done much studies in that direction. We've done some studies to compare the visual processing differences between readers and non-readers. And unfortunately, I'm not talking about it in this talk. I'm happy to uh, kind of share or talk of, you know, talk afterwards. But yeah, but uh, we haven't gone too much in that direction. It's an interesting, uh, you know, scenario for sure. Yeah. Uh, Meghna, you had a question? Uh, yes, sir. Like, uh, uh, I want. We usually don't come across situations where two languages are together unless it's like a sign board. Like, yeah. suppose I'm equally proficient, say, in English and Canada, and I look at a sign board. So, like, which would the brain prefer? Like, yeah, right. I mean, it's a it's a good question, and I would actually uh, add uh, the further question of if you know both English and Canada. Yeah. And you looked at a signboard containing English and Kannada. Yeah. Then how would I know whether you read the English one or the Kannada one? Yeah, or like or as a bias, like suppose in metro, yeah. usually I go through a metro and I see sign yeah, in yeah. English, Kannada, and Hindi. Right. So automatically, I I don't know which I see first, whether the English or the Kannada one, but I tend to ignore the one in Hindi. So I don't know which the brain would pick. Would it pick? Yeah. It? So I mean, what I'm what I'm also getting at is that you may yourself not know what you looked at first. Huh. Uh, sometimes because of your eye movement, one might be able to see that, okay, you made a sakar onto the English uh, text uh, versus okay. the Kannada text. Huh. But just because you looked at the English doesn't mean you didn't look at the Kannada because huh. of the yes. vision. And so actually, if you wanted to tease apart exactly which language you read when you saw two languages at the same time, it's actually huh. I think, a hard question. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's an objective way to measure which one you saw first. I mean, it's an interesting question. Uh, okay. And I would actually say that uh, many of these kinds of dichotomies uh, are things that we invent for ourselves. I would probably guess that the brain just reads both at the same time and activates some sort of shared representation or whatever. Uh, you know, brain doesn't sit and think, okay, should I read this first or that? Okay. A lot of vision is parallel. Yes, because it happens so quickly. Like. We look at the yeah, sign yeah. and yeah, again, so like again, that's that's a problem. So, for example, just because it happens quickly doesn't mean it's not serial. Huh, okay. uh, at the same time, just because it happens quickly doesn't immediately mean it's parallel. I mean, the question is like, how do you do the experiment to to prove that this is happening like serially or parallelly, right? Okay. So, like uh, usually, like say for example, timing is a good indication. If something is happening serially, mm -hmm. then you might say, okay, if I show both the English and Kannada words simultaneously to you, but then show you for a very short time. Okay. Then maybe you read only one of them and you did not read the other one. And I could have some test of whether you really saw like the first, you know, this one first or that one first and so on. I mean, there may be ways of teasing it apart, but like, I mean, a priori, just looking from the experience alone, it's very hard to infer whether it's serial or parallel and uh, whether you saw one, one versus the other. No, which uh, one saw first and all. Oh, I had just another small doubt. Yeah. Or does the brain tend to think it like uh, it's the same thing, or does it think like the gist is yeah. the same, or does it tend to ignore like it? Like suppose yeah. in a signboard, oh yeah, it means the same, and does it just move on? Or so um, we've uh, we've done some experiments where uh, we show people the image of an object and the word corresponding to that object, okay. and uh, it turns out that even if they're not doing a task related to whether these text and word are, I mean, whether the image and the word are actually related to each other. Huh. But when you show related, I mean, when you show a pair which is actually congruent, in other words, the image is matching the text, then somehow people are actually faster at detecting repeats and all that. Okay. And so it suggests that people are just automatically just reading it. I mean, they're not really, it's not like you have to do an explicit match and say that, oh, the, you know, the image of the crane is matching the word crane. It's okay. actually happening automatically, apparently. Oh, oh, wow, wow, thank you. So all much. fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I, I totally share your sort of uh, enthusiasm for this thing. I, I think a lot of these questions, 
you know, at least whatever we've been doing is all driven by some sort of just basic curiosity and not really like, I mean, we're not studying the literature and checking what's happening, sure. or what sure. people have done. It's more like just thinking, okay, fine, if I'm a bilingual reader and like, I mean, we haven't looked at bilingual responses, but we have certainly worried about like, if you see an object and a text, what happens? Uh, if you see a text and sound, then what happens? Mm -hmm. uh, does the when you read something how do I know that you're reading aloud and activating that sound representation or not activating the sound representation I mean what how do you actually prove these things right it's all well and good to say it but then just because I say it doesn't mean it's scientific truth right so like you have to actually prove that okay when Meghna read Kannada she actually activated the Kannada sound so and that's actually much more non-trivial I mean I have to prove it in some way and I have to think about how to prove it Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is so cool. Yeah. Um, I, I guess actually considering all the questions, maybe we should kind of stop here. I, I do have, uh, I mean, I, for those of you who are interested in understanding how these jumbled words are read by us, then I would suggest you go check out some of our recent uh, papers. There's, we, we think we've understood how we read jumbled words. Uh, and so I can, of course, I can talk about it, but I think... Uh, Let's not, uh, I think it's better if we take questions and you know, uh, have a more interactive session right now. Yeah, so maybe shall we stop here? I'm sorry to kind of uh, just stop in the middle of this, but um, I think it's better that way. So let me just uh, summarize and just uh, give a shout out to all the people in the lab. So this is, uh, uh, this is our lab at the moment. Uh, really nice and fun set of people. Everybody is looking at uh, all kinds of interesting uh, questions. I can barely keep up sometimes. And uh, if you're interested in this kind of work, really, you know, please get in touch. And uh, we're always looking for good people. And uh, these are all the funding agencies that actually fund our work. So this is uh, primarily uh, Welcome DBT India Lands, who've been great. Uh, and of course, uh, lots of support from ISC, DBT, DST, uh, DBT, ISC partnership, which has also been an important source of uh, support. So thank you all. Thanks for all the interesting questions. and. I guess we can take more questions at this time. Thank Sir, you so I have much. a couple of yeah. You have questions? Okay, so thank you so much for the very insightful talk, Dr. Arun. So may I now invite Dr. Poonam Thakur, the co-founder of the Mind Gala Initiative, to say a few words and deliver the vote of thanks. Yeah, me. We are not looking at formal yet, but yeah, I would really like to thank you, Arun, for joining us here. And it was really such a fun discussion. And I'm really, really uh, thankful to all the audience members who have kept the questions going. And the spirit that we have been looking for in this uh, webinar is that uh, it's to be a highly interactive thing. It's for you to really get into the things that interest you. That has really been honored today, and I'm really uh, happy to see that grow. Uh, in fact, we had some uh, audience member, uh, senior citizens also joining us, which was really encouraging to see because that's the kind of audience we intended to reach, not just, you know, people working in labs. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, you, all of the attendees, you are welcome to stay in touch with us through my gala, through our Twitter handle, through our website, to follow up on uh, more such webinars in future. And we would uh, really like to welcome you again with such uh, more such interactive talks uh, and fun discussions in the future. And thank you all for joining us today and staying here so much beyond the uh, time that we had told. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Arun, once again. Yeah, thanks. It's a and pleasure. Thank you all uh, a very happy new year. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Thakur. With this, we call it a day. We thank you all for being such a wonderful and patient audience. The Mind Gala will be back with a series of exciting initiatives around the year. So make sure to tune in to our social media handles to know more. Until then, stay safe and protected. Thank you once again. You all can now leave the meeting. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much.